Hello, hello, everybody. Welcome back to Heel Squad. It's gonna be a great day because we've got the glucose goddess on today. And if you don't know what that is, <laughs> you're about to find out. She's amazing and she's gonna change your life today. But first, our quote of the day, take care of your body. It's the only place you have to live. And that is by Jim Rohn. Friends, you are in for it today. We have an amazing episode with this woman I discovered on Instagram. I discovered her along with millions of other people. She talks all about glucose levels, and she really teaches you about nutrition in such an easy way that's bite-sized and really essential, right, for all of us who are like having those afternoon crashes or just always fatigued or having brain fog. A lot of that is probably because of what you're eating and how you're eating it. And you're going to learn so many hacks today that are so simple. She's not telling you to stop eating your chocolate cake. She's not telling you to stop having your frappuccino. She's going to tell you how to be able to have those things, but to do some other little things before that will help you to not have those crazy spikes so that you're not crashing down. Uh, It's one of my favorite episodes. I've learned so much that I can't wait to get off this chair and go start implementing. (laughs) And I think you guys will too. Jesse Inches Bay is a French biochemist, best selling author, founder of the Glucose Goddess Movement. She's helped millions of people improve their physical and mental health by making cutting edge science accessible and sharing her discoveries about the essential role of blood sugar in every aspect of our lives and the surprising hacks that are going to optimize it. Today, we're talking about her new book, The Glucose Goddess Method, your four week guide to cut cravings, get your energy back, and feel feel amazing. And Hail Squad, you guys are in for it. This is going to be a great chat. Uh, so without further ado, let's chat with Jesse Inches Bay. Well, Jesse, thank you so much for being with us. Um, I come from a family of diabetics. And so glucose is the word <laughs> in our <laughs> home. Um, I think it's something that's hard to understand if you don't deal with it on a daily basis in that kind of regard where it's absolutely necessary to understand what glucose is and what it does. And even with all of my knowledge, I think there's still some terms that we hear a lot like insulin resistance and all kinds of things like that. So let's talk about glucose and what it is and why we need to understand it. Love that question. Okay, so back to basics, essentially. And as you said, usually it's associated with diabetes, but actually it goes way, way further than that. So glucose is your body's favorite source of energy. Okay, so every single cell in your body uses glucose for energy. So right now, you know, our heart cells are using glucose to pump blood through our body. Our brain cells are using glucose to think and speak to each other. Every single part of your body loves using glucose to just live. Um, And the main way that us as humans get this very important glucose to our body is by eating foods, but specifically by eating two types of food. So starchy foods, which are like bread, rice, pasta, potatoes, and sweet foods. So that's anything that tastes sweet from your favorite chocolate cake to like a banana, right? So when we eat starches and sugars, we're giving this essential glucose to our body. So you might think, okay, I want lots of energy, so I should eat as many starchy and sweet foods as possible. So my body has as much glucose as possible, right? (laughs) Yes, bring on all the chocolate cake. (laughs) Exactly. So that's a pretty common logical conclusion to jump to, but actually it's not that simple. So just like a plant needs some water to survive, but if you give the plant too much water, then the plant drowns and you come home from vacation and your friend took care of the plants, put too much water in them, all the plants are dead, right? The human body is kind of the same when it comes to glucose. That is, it it is very happy to receive some glucose, but too much glucose and problems start happening. And specifically when you give too much body, too much glucose to your body too quickly, You experience what's called glucose spikes, and we can go into that further. But these spikes carry with them consequences, you know, anything from like cravings to brain fog to long-term type 2 diabetes. So this is all the stuff that I learned and why I'm so passionate about this topic is because 
Balancing your glucose levels really matters for everybody, whether or not you have diabetes. What did get you into this? Because of course, when I saw a glucose goddess on Instagram, I was like, she's got to be diabetic. And you're no, not. No, I'm not at all. So I don't have diabetes. Nobody in my family has diabetes. I don't really have any friends who have diabetes. Um, and what got me into this was like my my own personal you know, health struggle and journey. When I was younger, I had an accident. I broke my back jumping off a waterfall. So now I have all this metal in my spine and I suffered a lot physically, but I started developing a lot of mental health issues like in my early 20s because of that in a way. And that got me really interested in just health in the body and figuring out what we need to do to feel good on a daily basis because I felt completely broken. So it was like out of my own little quest to get back to health. And I learned by reading all the latest science on this that actually, you know, glucose spikes impact us all. Sure, if we have diabetes, then we should learn to steady our glucose levels to potentially put it in remission. But for me personally, I found that the more deregulated my glucose was, the worse my mental health was. And then I saw in the studies that kind of like depending on your body or health history, these spikes can lead to many different symptoms from infertility and not having your period anymore to, yeah, to brain fog, anxiety symptoms, depression symptoms, to wrinkles, psoriasis, eczema, I know, acne, uh, to sleep issues, and then long-term development of diabetes. But I discovered that really it doesn't matter just for people with diabetes. And so after learning about it and healing myself, I was like, everybody needs to know about this, yeah. <laughs> whether or not you have diabetes. Well, what you just said covers probably every issue that we all deal with. What yeah. were kind of the, what are the biggest things like for the average person who's listening right now, who's like, yeah, I don't know about that. Like, it seems like such a stretch that wrinkles or depression or my anxiety is coming from glucose issues. Mm -hmm. What are the main things that if you were to say, if I was to say, you know what, in the afternoon, I'm crashing, I'm exhausted, I need a coffee, mm -hmm. or, um, you know, I, I've got brain fog a lot. Like, what are the main kind of ones that someone can identify with right now? Yeah, the most common ones, the most common symptoms that your glucose levels might be causing symptoms are cravings so wanting to eat sweet foods between your meals feeling like if you walk past a bakery you're going to feel this urge to eat something from there and chronic fatigue so having your energy be really unsteady so often these things we kind of think that they're normal we sort of think it's normal to crave chocolate all day and it's normal to need five coffees a day so Often we kind of paper over those issues We're like, yeah, it's just me. Well, actually, because the studies show us that about 80% of the population of non-diabetics has these spikes on a daily basis. Like if you have any of those common symptoms, learning to study your glucose levels is a really important place to start. It's sort of like the foundation in a house, right? Mm -hmm. Your physical and mental health can't be top notch if your glucose levels are out of whack. But for most of us, we live our lives on this glucose roller coaster without even realizing. So a normal person's glucose levels, if they were to test their blood and prick their finger, mm -hmm. what would it be? Well, if you don't have diabetes, your glucose levels should be basically at all times underneath 110, I would say. If it's fasting, it should be under 100. But then as soon as you have prediabetes or type 2 diabetes, those numbers can go much, much, much higher, right? And one important point is that we thought for a long time, or the scientific community thought for a long time, that if you don't have diabetes, your glucose levels will never go above 140. You know, yeah. it's like impossible, impossible. Well, actually, that's changed. So scientists have discovered that even if you don't have diabetes, common foods can still spike your glucose levels to really high ranges. Like, for example, I don't have diabetes. I once spiked to 180, right? Yeah. And so just like just eating like cookies or whatever. And so that range of really high glucose levels, now we know that even if you don't have diabetes, you can easily reach it. 
And that's when issues start happening, when you see these really high spikes, because those cause inflammation and aging and insulin release, et cetera. And then after each spike, there's a crash. And that crash leads to many different symptoms, depending on who you are, but the most common ones being being super hungry, having those cravings for sugar, feeling exhausted. Some people feel nauseous, some people feel lightheaded, maybe they get a bit sweaty, maybe they say they're hangry, you know, they say, oh my God, I really need to eat something right now. Well, often that's just the consequence of being on this roller coaster. Yeah, I, I'm so glad that you shared that because I, I watched a video of two diabetics yeah. um, decide they're going to eat donuts and a non-diabetic, and they were going to check the blood sugars and see how they were able to do it. And the guy who didn't have diabetes, his blood sugar never really changed. But I think, as you said, really? yeah, it was weird. But I think the problem is that we're that we're having is everything has sugar in it now. Mm -hmm. So we're having less tolerance to it. And so everyone will start to spike. And, and spike more and yeah. more. And the more you do that, then eventually you do become type two diabetic or, exactly. you know, whatever. The food landscape, you know, the, the world we live in food wise is really difficult to navigate. And for most of us, we're eating in a way without even knowing it, that's spiking our glucose levels on a daily basis. And so of course you could say, okay, everybody just stop eating sugar, stop eating starches, you'll be fine. Like that's actually a completely not possible. Like, I don't even want to live in a world where I'm not eating chocolate and pasta. I'm I doing it. it. So the question. <laughs> <laughs> I did you it. You are? Oh, yeah. It's hard. Are you not finding it super difficult? It was, I did it very slowly. And mm. now it's super easy. Um, nice. But, you know, because I know the effects and how, yeah. how challenging it is. Um, mm -hmm. You know, and I, I come from diabetics. I, I have to be so careful. But, yeah. um, but I've done it. it. It took, it took a while, it, you know, just a lot of baby steps, but, yeah. um, but so then how and does the of, average person do it without uh -huh. going as extreme as me? Let's say that that's exactly where I was going is that there are things you can do that will still allow you to eat all the stuff that you want with less impact on your glucose. And I think that's really what I want to share with people are these really simple tips and tools and hacks that allow you to still have the cake and the bread and the pasta while still helping reduce some of these symptoms that most of us are contending with. So, you know, if you can't go as far as you're going, or if you just don't have the willpower or the possibility, which by the way, most of us don't, right? Like you're special, you're unique. The fact that you're able to do this is very out of the ordinary. So the question is for everybody else, like, what are some things we can do to feel better, have more energy, have fewer cravings, help our hormones, help our skin, help our sleep, prevent diabetes, or even put it into remission without doing something that might feel too intense, which is cutting out all carbs, right? So I have so many questions. Um, <laughs> so what do you, how could anything be possible to prevent the spike if you're going to eat chocolate cake like how could you ever avoid that is there something well, you can eat before yeah absolutely so there's lots of little tips and tricks that scientists have discovered and so everything i'm doing is basically just sharing that research with the general public so everything i'm going to say is all backed by scientific studies and clinical trials etc that have been done across the world so let's take the example of the cake so for the chocolate cake i would use i think three hacks. So the first hack I would use, I'm going to tell you the whole process. So instead of just having the cake on its own, I would do a vinegar drink. Then I would have 10 almonds. And then after the cake, I would go for a walk. Okay. So those are three things you can do. There's also lots of other things you can do, but those are the ones that I think are most relevant. If it's like the middle of the afternoon and you just really want to slice it. What do each of those do? Yeah, we're going to go into it. Okay. okay so vinegar. This might sound a bit crazy and like it's a fad, but it's not, I promise. And when I first heard about it, I was also like, this can't be true, but it is. So if you have one tablespoon of vinegar in a big glass of water before you eat something high in glucose, you can reduce the spike of that food by up to 30%. No way. Yeah. What if you just do and the tablespoon raw? 
you can, but dentists don't like it because it ah. could be a bit bad for your teeth. Yeah. Okay. So ideally you dilute it. Okay. And if you want to be extra, extra, extra careful, you also have it with a straw. Okay. I love drinking vinegar. I've been drinking it since I was little. Yeah. <laughs> all of my you salads are soups. <laughs> Exactly. And this trick also works if you're having the vinegar as a dressing, you know, you can make a little tea, a little mocktail, you can have pickles. So the reason it works is because vinegar contains a molecule called acetic acid. This molecule is very cool. What it does, let's take the example of the chocolate cake, acetic acid, when it's in your stomach, it slows down how quickly that chocolate cake is going to turn into individual glucose molecules. So it slows down how quickly the glucose is arriving into your bloodstream and into your system, therefore reducing the spike. And the acetic acid goes to your muscles and it tells your muscles to soak up extra glucose as it arrives into your bloodstream. Whoa. So that's a really powerful thing to do. Yeah, it's What amazing. kind of vinegar? It can be any kind of vinegar okay. because acetic acid is in all vinegars. Oh, great. The one I would say, like, be a bit cautious is like the very syrupy balsamic glaze because that usually has a bunch of added sugars in it anyway. Yeah. But other than that, any type of vinegar works, which is so cool. That's great. So that's the first thing I would oh, use. That tip cake. alone yeah. just changes lives. That's a lot. 30%. Really and also 20% for the insulin spike. So Every time there's a glucose spike, your body releases insulin as a response to get that glucose down. But too much insulin over time, that's what leads to type 2 diabetes. So you want to also reduce how much insulin is being produced. And acetic acid in the vinegar does that as well. That's so great. just that, if you try nothing else, test that out. And you probably will start feeling quite differently. You know, your energy levels will improve. You have fewer of those cravings after eating that food that's high in glucose. Because many of us feel like addicted to sugar. You know, I yeah. hear that sentence a lot. Oh, I'm just addicted to sugar. Well, what people don't realize is that often they can be causing that glucose roller coaster and that sugar addiction roller coaster just by how they're eating. So Outside you, of the sugar? Yeah, well, no, if, how they're eating that's causing spikes. So for example, if you have a breakfast that's like granola and a fruit juice, that's going to be a big glucose spike. And then so all day, you're going to be up and down and up and down. And then at 10 p.m., you're craving ice cream and you don't realize that it's that breakfast mm. that kicked off that roller coaster that's causing it, right? Wow. Mm -hmm. See, so oh, if you're man, there's so much to learn. And, you know, I endocrinologists know. do not teach you to do the vinegar trick. Why wouldn't they teach you to do the vinegar trick? Because at the very least, for non-diabetics, it would prevent you from obviously those big spikes, but even for diabetics, it would be so helpful. You'd probably need less insulin. Listen, my perspective is that all of these hacks, all this science is all new. So people are sort of getting word of it and now sharing it. I work with a lot of doctors. Like there are a lot of doctors that follow my work and share this with their patients, but clearly not enough. Like we need everybody to be talking about this, but that's why you and I are here. We're trying to spread this important science. So I'm hopeful that at one point, this is going to be common practice. Yeah. Okay. So, okay, so vinegar is number vinegar. one. <laughs> yeah. Vinegar is number one. Then we're gonna, So the reason I was saying we're going to add 10 almonds before the chocolate cake is because of this other hack called put clothing on your carbs. So that's the hack. You might think like, what is she talking about? So carbs again are starches and sugars. So bread, pasta, rice, potatoes, or anything sweet. So in the case of this cake, like that's sweet and that's also carbs. So if you eat carbs naked, that is if you eat them on their own. So if you have just a chocolate cake or if you have just a big bowl of pasta, the glucose in them is going to arrive really quickly into your stomach, upper intestine and bloodstream, right? Nothing is slowing them down. Nothing is helping reduce how quickly they're arriving into your system. Now, what I want people to do is to put clothing on their carbs. That means to add some protein, fat, or fiber every time they're eating carbs. You're, you're, you're nodding your head because you know this, this is one. what I do. Yeah. I, and I <laughs> yell at my dad every day when he's eating because he'll just eat a big bowl of lima beans. I'm like, dad, you got to eat protein, fat, mm -hmm. and fiber 
and then the carbs. <laughs> yeah, exactly. So yeah. when you add the protein, fat, and fiber, essentially what you're doing is you're adding more molecules to the mix in your stomach, right? And those molecules, they slow down how quickly the glucose is arriving in your system. And it actually asks you to eat more than usual, right? And yet you're reducing the spike and helping your body. So the easiest way for me to put clothes on my carbs when I'm eating like a chocolate cake is just to grab 10 almonds. You can grab hazelnuts, you can grab a Greek yogurt, you can even have some broccoli before, like whatever, whatever is like a vegetable or a protein or a nut or a fat that you find is helpful. In the case of, for example, eating like a big plate of pasta, make sure you're adding maybe some spinach, maybe some chicken, maybe, you know, some cheese or something so that it's not just those naked carbs. So that's another nice one and that's why it's the second thing i would do in the chocolate cake situation i love that i we had a another expert on the show her name is elisa vt are you familiar with I her i love her she's yes, wonderful of she taught us about the layering effect and it was game changing for me so she said before you eat anything eat vegetables then eat your protein and fat and then eat your carbs and it was yes. a tough thing at first cuz i'm like well i make chia puddings with like almonds and things like that and i grab those and go I'm going to eat salad now before I eat this kind of sweet, delicious little chia pudding thing. But I did it. And so sometimes it's a salad. Sometimes it's um, celery sticks. But I start with vegetables. And I've been training anybody who can listen around me. Start with vegetables, then layer on the other things. And I've seen a huge difference in so many things. I mean, even my digestive system is eliminating in such Mm -hmm. a better way um, than it ever was. That's awesome. And the reason we start with the veggies is because the veggies contain fiber. And so when the fiber arrives first in our upper intestine, it has time to create this protective like mesh and that mesh then stays in place and prevents your body from absorbing too many glucose molecules coming down afterwards. So the veggies first, that's another hack. And it's just, it's very powerful. It's very, very, very powerful. If you do nothing else, add a plate of vegetables to the beginning of your meals when it's easy, not when it's super complicated and you don't want to, but when it's easy, that has a big impact on your glucose levels. It's really powerful. Yeah. Like last night I was naughty. I went to a Mexican restaurant and I had some corn chips first and I'm like, this is so against my, my normal process. But I was like, a friend is in town. I'm, (laughs) I'm just going to go for it. But, um, and to be honest, like personally, I do the hacks when it's easy You know, like if I wake up and it's Sunday morning and I want ice cream for breakfast because I just do, like I'll have it, you know, I'll just do the hacks when they're easy and the rest of the time I don't do them and that's fine. I think it's important to bring people some, some balance because you don't have to do this all the time. I want you to learn these tools like you would, you know, invite like these gentle giants into your life. And then you use them whenever it's easy and whenever you feel like it. And it's not a diet. It's not about doing this perfectly all the time. It's really about just learning these tips and tricks that stay with you for life. It's a really nice approach. Um, I I feel like um, the movement part of this is really important too. And that was yeah. something that I started learning as well is, um, you know, when your body's producing insulin to take down that mm-hmm. food, you kind of can put it on crack. <laughs> That's my way of describing it by exercising <laughs> after you, you yeah. eat. So it kind of helps poof, really like lower blood sugars as well. Absolutely. Yeah, yeah, exactly. And so after the cake, go for a walk, or you can even my new favorite way of moving after eating is to do calf raises at your desk. So you just sit at your desk and you just calf raise up and down, up and down, because in your calf, there's this muscle called the soleus muscle, which is really good at soaking up glucose. Yeah. And so if you can't do anything else, just do that. I mean, if you go to the gym, that's great. Yeah. But you don't have to do like super intense exercise to start seeing some benefits. I think I saw that on your Instagram because I'm like, wait, that sounds familiar. I think I saw that on Glucose Goddess. Yeah, yeah, you did. Yeah, we did a Science Tuesday about it um, a month ago. Yep. And that's a really nice one. <laughs> and I'm all about easy hacks, easy tips that you can do, you know, in the comfort of your home without anybody noticing. Like, that's the whole point to do stuff that's actually doable, not to organize these really complicated rules that feel like so stressful to put in place. So, moving after eating is great because, as you said, basically, when your muscles are contracting, they need energy to do so. 
the first place they look for that energy is in your bloodstream. They look for glucose molecules. So you can use that to your advantage. So if you move within 90 minutes after eating, some of the glucose from the meal is going to be used by your muscles. And so the spike will reduce in your body. So there you go. That's the perfect combo for chocolate cake in the afternoon. What do you think about berberine as a way to lower blood sugar? Listen, when it comes to supplements, I'm like, go for it. Totally fine. But don't minor in the majors. Like, don't not change how you're eating and just add berberine to your life. Like, maybe it'll help a little bit. But realistically, if, for example, you have veggies at the beginning of a meal or you change your breakfast to not spike you, that'll have a more powerful impact. So if for some reason somebody can't do any hacks, then yes, of course, it's helpful to add berberine or other things. But try to do both. I think that'll be even more powerful. Yeah, start with the food. So let's talk about food and how to avoid that cycle because I thought it was really poignant to describe the sugar addict and kind of maybe why they're addicted to sugar. So now you don't have to feel like, oh, it's me. I have this problem. Exactly. Exactly. It's really actually the choices that I'm making. So if I just make those adjustments, I won't be addicted to sugar anymore. Exactly. And so there was this amazing scientific experiment done at Yale University in America, and they put people in an MRI, fMRI scanner. So they were seeing the inside of their brain and they were showing them on a screen all these photos of high calorie foods. So like cookies, burgers, blah, blah, blah. And the poor participants and the scientists were also measuring the participants glucose levels in real time. And they were asking the participants to rate how much they wanted to eat the food they were seeing. And so what the scientists found was that when their glucose levels were steady, they didn't really rate any of those foods highly. However, when their glucose levels were low, which can happen after a spike, you crash. When their glucose levels were low, two things happened. First, the participants were like, oh yeah, cookie, oh yeah, I want that, oh yeah, burger, yes. They started rating those really highly. And the scientists found that the craving center in the participants' brains, the part of your brain that is responsible for cravings, started lighting up. And they were seeing that on the fMRI images. So the scientists saw that when our glucose levels are low, there is a deep, like ancestral biological reaction that makes us crave foods. So all this to say, exactly to your point, if you're having all these cravings, willpower is not going to help. Like you cannot fight that ancestral part of your brain and feeling ashamed or guilty, et cetera. Like that's not actually the way to go because it's not your fault. Those cravings might just be coming up because of what you had for breakfast and now you're dropping and that craving is just due to your breakfast so if you fix the root cause of it all then often those cravings go away and you know in my readers and in the people who follow my method that's the first thing that goes 90 percent of people after my four-week method have cut their cravings so that's just to tell you how much the cravings are really a response to that glucose roller coaster. Well, and if your sugar is so low and having dealt with my dad's low blood sugars for over 40 years, it's a survival thing. Absolutely. That's why yeah. you can't override it. It's like your body's slowly dying in a sense, right? Mm-hmm. And it needs that sugar boost to come back. And so totally. when you're exhausted, you're always like, oh, it's so I'm so tired. And it's because I'm working so much and it's because of the baby or like whatever. We have all these things that we will attribute to us needing craving, uh, needing sugars or um, not feeling well and being exhausted. And it's really, like you said, it's these spikes, these highs and lows. You're getting the Frappuccino. Absolutely. It's loaded with sugar. And then you crash mm-hmm. and you think it's just normal because you hate your job and you're tired, but it's yeah. not. And that's why I think this is such an important conversation is like, none of this is normal. We're not and supposed to be. you. Exactly. Right? You don't, you're not a hangry person. Yes. You're not a person who's addicted to sugar. Like all these symptoms, to me, the way I see them, they're like messages coming from your body. Be like, mm-hmm. Hello. Knock, knock, there's a roller coaster happening within, right? Yeah. And if you flip 
the narrative a little bit you're like wait a minute instead of feeling this is just me my body is against me my body hates me that's just who i am what if you started seeing those as like these little notifications you know of like there's this roller coaster happening within what if you fix that and then these things will go away yeah well and <clears throat> and if you're going low all the time because you know we all say the same things culturally like we'll be like oh my god i have low blood sugar all the time yes like, and that's like do you even know what that means no right but but we'll all say this stuff and and it's like oh my god the afternoon slump i have to get my coffee mm-hmm. like we all normalize these things and what scares me is it just leads to the next condition and the next condition and the next condition mm-hmm. health wise the next diagnosis so if we can really stop and realize that our body is sending us these notifications and say, oh, okay, this isn't me necessarily. I can make some different choices and I'll feel better. Now, in the beginning, it sucks to give up that muffin in the morning and that frappuccino. It sucks because you're used to it and you love it and it's delicious, but you're going to feel so much better when you have an egg white omelet and you have a little <laughs> salad before and some avocado. So let's talk about breakfast, right? Because as you said, like that's the moment in the day where most people are kicking off that roller coaster. So my hack is very simple. It's go from having a sweet breakfast to having a savory breakfast. So as you said, like a breakfast centered around protein, this will radically transform how you feel for the rest of the day. And you don't have to completely give up the muffin and the frappuccino. Here's the secret. So (laughs) you can have them. (laughs) You can have them as dessert after your lunch or after your dinner. That way you still get the pleasure and the dopamine that we're all after, but you're not creating a glucose spike and you're not starting off that roller coaster. So yes, breakfast is kind of the moment where you have to be strong and you have to try to switch over to savory. And one one tip I give people if they can't, like let's say your breakfast is usually a muffin and a frappuccino. So you don't have to, in my world, my philosophy, like going cold turkey might be a bit intense. So what you could do is actually have that omelet you're talking about and then have the muffin and the frappuccino. Then the next day, have the omelet, have half the muffin and then the frappuccino. And then by the third day, you're going to be like, I don't even want the muffin anymore because your glucose levels will be steady, right? So start by just preloading what's called preloading which means just eating first something with protein that's that's the way to go for to make it easy i i like the baby steps approach that's how i've done everything even um when i lost 40 pounds i went from eating like this massive bacon egg and cheese bagel sandwich in the morning and what i went to was i would cut a little piece off the top of the bread and then that would get easy, and then I would cut the rest of it, and then I would eat it open face. Then I would eventually just get rid of the bread, and I was like, oh. So if you do it really slowly, you'll you'll get kind of impressed by yourself and be like, I can do this. I got this. Yes, and then you'll realize that actually when your glucose is steady, it's not hard to then make those better choices, yes. right? Because your body is just happy, and you feel good, and mm-hmm. you feel less hungry you don't have those cravings you feel clear you feel excited so it becomes effortless like even if you just sort of sit back relax just add in these hacks you'll naturally see that after a few days you won't even want all those things anymore because your body will get back into balance and will start sending you the proper signals again of like oh i want this but i don't need that frappuccino that was just because of the roller coaster yeah so explain insulin resistance Mm-hmm. Okay, so when there's a glucose spike in your body, your body knows that that high glucose level is not good. So your body is going to try to get that glucose level down. It's going to try to put some of that extra glucose away. And the way it does that is through the help of insulin. So insulin is an amazing hormone and it comes from your pancreas. And so insulin comes out and it grabs all the extra bits of glucose and it stores them in these storage compartments, in your muscles, in your liver, and in your fat cells, okay? So insulin is great. It's really protective against the damage of these high glucose levels. Now, the thing is, over time, too much insulin starts accumulating in your body. And a little bit like the first time you ever have a cup of coffee, you're like, wow, that's strong. And then after five years of having coffee every day, 
you need maybe five coffees to still feel that strong effect. So you have become resistant to coffee. That's what it's called, desensitized. Yeah, it's like skincare or hair care. You get resistant too. You have to switch it up too. Yeah, absolutely. And so insulin inside your body is the same. Over time, you need more and more insulin to do that same job of putting glucose away because your body has become resistant to it. And that's called insulin resistance. And the worse that insulin resistance gets, the less good your body is is able to put that extra glucose away. So slowly your glucose levels rise and rise and rise and rise. And then that's type 2 diabetes. So insulin resistance and type 2 diabetes are the same thing. But how insulin resistant you are is going to determine whether whether you have prediabetes, type 2 diabetes, really extreme type 2 diabetes, etc. And so you know, one of the ways to put that diabetes into remission is just to reduce the amount of insulin in your body so that resistance can go down. And how do we reduce the amount of insulin in our body? By reducing the glucose spikes that we're giving our body with how we're eating. And that's why the hacks really help a lot of people with type 2 to get those numbers down and put it in remission. Because type 2 diabetes is not a genetic disease, right? It's a disease that is caused by these years and years and years of eating in a certain way that's influencing and increasing insulin resistance. So in most cases, unless it's really advanced, like you can put it in remission and really get back to health. What about what they're calling now as type three diabetes, which is what they're associating with dementia, right? I know it's crazy. So it's pretty wild, but scientists are discovering that In the brain, when people have Alzheimer's disease, similar things are happening as in the rest of the body when somebody has type 2 diabetes. So insulin resistance is happening in the brain. Inflammation from the spikes and the extra insulin are happening in the brain. And that seems to actually be the cause of Alzheimer's. And that's why some people call Alzheimer's type 3 diabetes. And it shows in the data, right? Like if you have prediabetes, you're twice as likely to get Alzheimer's disease. Like we're starting to learn like, whoa, these things are really correlated. So scientists might find that actually Alzheimer's is a metabolic disease. It has to do with glucose and insulin. Uh, So that's another reason to take care of your glucose levels. Although, you know, I think it's a bit more motivating for most people to think, okay, steadying my glucose is going to reduce cravings and help me feel better and age less fast. But also long term, you're preventing these kinds of issues, which is so, so important. Well, and also energy levels. It sucks when you don't have energy. Um, And also, you know, the anxiety and the depression and all of that, I'd love for you to speak more about how that is associated with this and what that really does. Because, you know, again, it's something that you could easily be like, oh, it's not connected to that. It's because I broke up with my boyfriend or it's because of this or it's because of that. Well, mental health is multifaceted. Like that's for sure, right? It's not like just one thing is influencing it. But we know from the studies that the more spikes you have in your diet, the more you're going to feel symptoms of any underlying anxiety or depression if that's something you're struggling with. And me, in my first discovery of the world of glucose, that's exactly what I saw. So I saw that the more spikes I was having, the worse my mental health, my dissociation, my anxiety, my depression were getting. Uh, And so that's a really interesting connection. And essentially, it kind of makes sense because your brain uses a lot of glucose. And the cells in your brain will feel the impact of a glucose spike. They will feel the inflammation. They will feel the glycation and the aging. They will feel the insulin resistance. And a common symptom actually of glucose spikes is brain fog. So when you feel like, you know, your memory is a bit off, you can't really think, you know, you don't know where your keys are. You're just like, oh, I feel sluggish, like kind of in a fog. That brain fog can often just be the cause, sorry, can often be the consequence of glucose spikes happening in your brain. And when glucose spikes happen in your brain, the information between your brain cells, between your neurons, doesn't go through as quickly as it should. It kind of slows down. You know, your neurons get a bit like sluggish and damaged and that electrical impulse with the information is slowed down. And you can feel that as brain fog, which I think is just totally wild because it gets a bit confusing sometimes because when you eat something sweet, you kind of feel like that (gasps) that rush, you feel awake right? It's it's cocaine for the brain. (laughs) Exactly. Right. Because it's releasing all that dopamine in the brain. And so 
that pleasure molecule. So a lot of people will think that's energy. They'll think like, oh, I'm having orange juice and cereal and I feel awake and I feel good. They'll be like, oh, I'm getting energy. Actually, that's just dopamine. But on the inside, your cells over time with every glucose spike are getting less good at actually creating energy. So after a few years, you might be having your cereal and your orange juice in the morning, yet you're chronically fatigued. And you're like, I don't understand. I'm eating all the sugar. It should be giving me energy. Well, it's because on the inside, the opposite is happening. Too much sugar leads to less energy. Let's talk about juices, since you mentioned orange juice, and smoothies, Mm -hmm. and kind of these hidden places where people are ingesting so much sugar so fast. Yeah. It's, you know, I was at the airport the other day, and I, I saw this green smoothie to buy and it, you know on the outside it looks so healthy mm-hmm. like they do such a good job of making it look like <laughs> this is gonna this is gonna be so good for you babe yeah. like you're just it's so good for your body and it's all green it has all these vegetables and you're like oh my god and then you turn it over and it's like apple juice pineapple juice orange juice 40 you know, grams of sugar carbs. yeah half 80 sugar. carbs because <laughs> <laughs> you gotta look at the so, carbs too yeah, absolutely. So you need to look at the ingredients. Like that's the first place you need to look. If you've never flipped over a package, like now don't trust what's on the front. Like you just, just flat out do not trust what's on the front. You always have to look at what's actually in the food. So let's talk about juices and smoothies. This is actually one of my favorite topics. I think it's fascinating. So a lot of people don't know this, but the fruit that we buy today in supermarkets is not natural. It is the result of thousands of years of selective breeding by humans. So from a very long time, we've been selecting the juiciest oranges and the juiciest bananas and breeding those together to make juice that is extra sweet, extra easy to eat, you know, extra full of sugar. A little bit like humans have bred gray wolves into today's chihuahuas, right? For fun, basically. Wait, chihuahuas or gray wolves? But all dogs come from gray wolves. Oh, okay. So you know what I mean? So humans have been breeding all these dogs to make these different races just for for fun. Similarly, we've been breeding all these fruits to make them just more palatable and easier to eat and fuller of sugar. Wow. So if you look at an ancestral banana, it's this big. It's tiny. It has so many seeds in it. It is not sweet and it's hard to eat. No way. bananas... I promise. Yes. And today's bananas are just like dessert. Yeah. So that's first step. Now, the thing is, if you want to eat something sweet, having a piece of whole fruit is still fine because fruit contains fiber in it. And fiber, as I explained, does that protective thing in your upper intestine. So it reduces the spike from the sugar. But the problem arises when you start denaturing that piece of fruit. So if you juice it, Let's say you juice an apple. So remember, that apple is not natural. That apple is a really sweet human-made apple. So if you juice it, you're removing all the fiber. The fiber is the solid material that you're removing. And you're just putting all of that sugar into water, basically. Like apple, apple juice is just sugar in water. But a lot of people will think, oh, it came from a fruit, so it's good for me. Mm -mm. Your body does not make the difference whether... Those sugar molecules came from an apple and are in apple juice, or whether they came from a cane and are now in a can of Coca-Cola. Like your body wow. processes them all the same. I'm thinking about all the little kids with their apple juice. I know. Right? It breaks my heart that that's still given in hospitals. Fruit uh, yes. is given every morning. Mm-hmm. Wow. Yeah, it's wild. Uh, so yeah, j- fruit juice is dessert. Reduces for your pleasure. Like if you love it, have it as dessert. Well, the thing is, is, and this is what um, my nutritionist who's been on the show, Alyssa Goodman, has always said. She's like, eat the fruit, don't drink the fruit. And because it just, the, it's just pure sugar going into your system. And and it's going to go faster than even the chocolate cake, right? Because that cake has, has density that's got to be broken Absolutely. down. So, um, so if you're going to have some orange juice, you have a little craving, you really just want to have a little, and probably like you said, wrap it in something, have those almonds before, right? Yeah. Or have it as dessert, you know, but I just want people to be conscious. 
Like it's fine to drink fruit juice, but I don't want people to drink it thinking it's good for them. Yes. That pisses me off. Yeah. Because they're sick, they don't feel good, they're tired, they're inflamed, and they're drinking this orange juice thinking like, oh, you know, that's good for us because it comes from fruit, etc. I want to help people break free of all those myths and marketing messages. That's really important. Yeah. And the green juices too, like, uh, you know, even if you go into like a really good green juice place, mm-hmm. because they know we are mere mortals and we can't handle just plain green juice, they're going to throw pineapple in there, mango, and all kinds of other fruit to make it sweet. But again, that's again, just liquid sugar going in. Yes, you're getting all these greens too. So I'm sure it's a better balance than obviously not, but I always look for the ones that have nothing. And, and if I ever was to get something made fresh, I would say, can you put like a quarter of an apple in there just so I have a little something, um, to make it sweeter. Um, but those juices in the, the airports are so funny because like you said, everyone thinks, and they make the sacrifice in their mind. They make yeah. the sacrifice, and that's what makes me sad, is you're making that sacrifice thinking, I'm drinking something good. It's a green smoothie. And look at all the things it has in there. It has kale. I don't want to eat kale. I'll, I'll drink it in this. <laughs> Fine. It's got spinach and all these things. But when you flip it, I want you to explain, obviously, you're going to look at the sugar content, and that's going to be a lot. And, and so you've got that, but you also have the carbs that turn into sugar if you don't burn the carbs in exercise. So explain that whole process so people understand. It's like a double whammy. You've got both you got to consider. Well, so in most nutrition labels, you'll see you'll see total protein, total fat, and then you'll see total carbs. And then underneath total carbs, you'll see total sugars. And actually sugars are part of carbs. So carbs are this umbrella term for starches and sugars, okay, essentially. And so when it says total carbs like 50 grams, and then it says total sugars, 40 grams, you're like, where's that 10 thing? Well, that 10 thing are usually starches or they're things that are not technically sugar, but are still carbs. So listen, the most important place to look is going to be the total sugars line and And even more than that, I would say the ingredients. Like I want people to learn how to decipher that, the ingredients label. That is really where all the information lies. So if you turn over a green smoothie and it says it says anything with a piece of fruit, if it says strawberry puree, if it says, you know, mango concentrate, if it says apple juice, whatever, that's gonna be just basically sugar. So just know that you're having dessert. And you can also have a little fun and compare like the nutrition labels of that smoothie with the Coca-Cola. And you might see that the number of total sugars are actually pretty similar. And again, your body doesn't care whether those sugars are coming from that mango concentrate and apple juice or whether they're coming from the sugar that somebody puts in a can of Coke. It's all very, very similar. And I want to say something about smoothies. So I have this comparison on my Instagram, which is two whole apples versus two smoothied apples versus two juiced apples. So when you juice apples, you're completely removing all the fiber. When you smoothie apples, you're not removing anything, you're just blending it all. So you might think, oh, maybe that's just as good as eating the whole apple. Well, it's not because when the metal blades of a blender are going through that apple, they're pulverizing the fiber particles and making them way less effective. So Yes, a smoothie is better than, for example, an apple smoothie is better than an apple juice, but still it's much worse for you, for your glucose than the real whole apple. So what I started doing, by the way, I want to also get to added sugars. Um, what I started doing of, to avoid smoothies, because I really wanted to get my flax seed and my chia seed and my protein fat, like I wanted to get some of those things in. I just made it in the yogurt. Yeah. So I nice. mix that all into yogurt. This way I don't have to blend everything and make it something. Because also when you blend a smoothie, you're using yeah. a straw and you're sucking it down so fast. So no matter how so slow you want to try to drink it, you can't. Totally, totally, totally. No, absolutely, absolutely. And so listen, smoothies, 
some are really actually fine because if you have protein powder in there and you have fats and you have nice pro you know protein and fiber and you have a few like berries for taste that's fine right it's not going to create that big of a spike and in my book i have my favorite recipe for like a smoothie that actually keeps your glucose level steady the problem is when you have a smoothie that's pure fruit well that's mostly fruit and doesn't contain any protein any fat you know that's really where the damage starts happening so all smoothies are not equal there's such a great wide point. spectrum of what they're going to do to your body yeah great point i made one for my dad the other day and i think it was pretty oh, good what was in it i had blueberries greek yogurt almond milk walnuts chia flaxseed protein powder nice i think that was it that yeah. sounds perfect and sometimes that i'll throw spinach wonderful. in like frozen oh or frozen cauliflower too Oh, nice. Does he like your smoothie? Does he drink it? Yeah. Oh, that's awesome. <laughs> Love it. <laughs> um, talk to me about the added sugars as well. What does that yeah. mean? That is just a big ass scam. So added sugars, let's take a smoothie, for example, like one of the smoothies you see at the airport. So added sugars just means that the sugar during the process of making that smoothie was added like poured in and didn't come from a piece of fruit that was then blended. But it, it really like doesn't mean anything. For some reason, the marketing people want you to believe that if the sugar came from an apple, then it was juiced and put into this juice, it's very different than if somebody took a spoonful of sugar and added it to the juice. It's the same, guys. It's totally the same. So if something says no added sugars, I don't care. I'm still going to look at the food like ingredients. And there it might say apple juice. It might say, you know, mango concentrate. It might say date puree. Those are all sugar molecules that are going to have the same impact on your body as added sugar, not that bad added sugar, the tablespoon of sugar into the recipe. It's all the same. So that's really something that I want people to learn about. Like it doesn't matter if it's added or if it came from a fruit and is in the recipe, it's all the same for your body. Yeah. You know what I've discovered is a really great replacement for pasta, by the way. I don't know why I was just thinking Tell about me. this. Um, hearts of palm pasta. I'm a pasta girl. I can't replace my pasta. Like I'm having pasta. It's so I'm good. Pasta. Have you really? tried it? Yeah. No. We made, um, Does it taste like pasta? We made a shrimp, um, hearts of palm kind of Alfredo-y mix. Mm. It that was insane. Nice, it was so yeah. good. Yes. Nice. I love I it. love hearts of palm. I use them in salads all the time. But um, I also just love real pasta. <laughs> <laughs> and, and that's also, you know, I mean, it's different philosophies, right? My philosophy is like, if you're going to have pasta or you're going to have chocolate cake, like have the real stuff, you know, yeah. personally. I'm not a big like keto ice cream person. I'm not a big like sweetener is this. I'm like, eat what you love and use the hacks so they have less of an impact on your body. That's I think more that's my the advice. best again, message. I love the real stuff for the most part as well. Because there was a moment yeah. when I was like, oh, I'm going to do the Beyond Meat Burgers. And then I'm like, wait, all the stuff they're putting in this is synthetic and fake. Or, you know, some of those vegan um, fast food places that everything is fake and, and made. Yeah. I'm like, I'd rather eat real butter. I'd rather eat you know, the real stuff most of the time too. So, um, so I'm on the same page since you just mentioned sweeteners, I'm going to try to end yeah. with this, even though I could talk to you for 30,000 hours. <laughs> um, do artificial sweeteners act as sugar in the body? No. no. So that's another myth. People say artificial sweeteners are bad. It's better to have real sugar. I'm like, nah, -uh. okay. So artificial sweeteners, first of all, again, there's a big spectrum, right? So you have the ones that are actually pretty harmless, like monk fruit, allulose, stevia, like that doesn't have that big of an impact on your body. Then you have some that are less good, like maltitol, aspartame, like you want to avoid those. But even those bad ones, what they do is they might mess up your microbiome. They might make you crave more sweet foods than you would if you weren't having anything sweet. Like, yes, 100%. They're not like great to add to your diet, but real sugar has way more bad side effects than these artificial sweeteners. Always, always, always pick a diet Coke 
over the real Coke. Like there's no, <laughs> yeah, pas photo, as we say in French. Like, yeah, pas photo. There's, I don't know why that expression exists. Like there's no photo, which means like it's it's clear as day. Like there's no, in no world is real sugar going to be better for you than artificial sweeteners. Like the, the sugar molecules are really what's going to be the most inflammatory, create the most insulin resistance, increase glycation, impact your brain even more. Um, so it's all relative, right? Yeah. And the inflammation is the, the last point, I think, because, you know, a lot of people might say, well, I'm not going to have to deal with diabetes and I, I don't really buy into this glucose stuff. The sugar really does create a lot of inflammation in the body, which inflammation is the root cause of so many diseases. Three out of five people in the world are going to die of an inflammation-based disease. Wow. And listen, for, for these hacks... If you're listening and you think, okay, I could actually feel better than I currently do in any way, shape, or form. Maybe it's your mood, maybe it's your energy, maybe it's your cravings, your hunger, your skin, your hormones, your sleep. Make sure your glucose levels are steady. This is a very foundational piece of health. Like it's, you can't have a healthy body, healthy mind if you're on a glucose roller coaster all day. And uh, you can use these simple hacks that will help you change this and set yourself up for success. And it doesn't have to be restrictive. These are just like very important key principles that are interestingly like now backed by all this science, but also that we've kind of known about culturally for a very long time, right? Vinegar, like in France and Europe, we drink vinegar all the time. We put it on everything. Veggies first. Culturally, so many countries have the veggies at the beginning of a meal, right? Walking after eating. I mean, all these things make so much reasonable sense. And now we understand how they work in the body. It means so much sense outside of America. <laughs> Here we're like, supersize me. <laughs> oh, yeah, but supersize me, but with a salad before. Yes, exactly. Um, thank you so much. This has been such a great conversation, Jesse. I, I can't wait to have you on again. And I love your simple approach to all of it. So guys, check out her Instagram. It's literally the best. So mm -hmm. thanks, girl. And for anybody listening, if you find this maybe a bit overwhelming, you don't know where to start. So my new book is exactly trying to address that question. It's called The Glucose Goddess Method. And over the span of four weeks, I help you onboard the four most essential hacks into your life. Breakfast, vinegar, veggies first, and movement. It's kind of like your, your fast track to steadying your glucose. No restrictions, no calorie counting, lots of super easy recipes. So if you don't know where to start, but this is interesting you, that's the place to start. And so uh, where can they get the book? Anywhere that sells books. I mean, online, you can check out my Instagram, Glucose Goddess. I have all the links there. Uh, my website, awesome. glucosegoddess.com. Yeah. Um, so that was everything I thought it was going to be and more. She's amazing. Um, I think that there's so many tips that I can just now implement into my life. And you know me, you know, I'm going to, I'm going to throw that vinegar in before every meal. I'm going to make sure I move after every meal. I kind of have like forgotten about that a little bit. Um, yeah. Kels, what do you think? She's amazing. She was everything I thought she was going to be too. I followed her for so long and I've been trying to get her on the show for so long. And I'm just so grateful. Like she makes everything so easy easy and digestible and I really really loved like I'm a very big proponent of like don't you don't need to cut everything out but you just need to be doing it better and I love that she was saying that and I'm just like heck yeah we can all do these simple easy things I'm going to do the vinegar I'm going to do the movement too like the savory breakfast I feel like I already kind of do but definitely going to be adding more protein more protein what a what a game changer I mean, seriously so I'm so excited I really like I love episodes like this where it's like that's simple and easy and digestible. And like, I can do that. I can actually do that. Yeah. And stick to it. So I'm excited. Yeah, me too. Awesome. All right, friends, as usual, um, don't forget to leave us a review. Um, you can click on the link in the summary of this episode and let us know if this impacted you. And by the way, if you implement this and it changes your life in any kind of way, let us know as well. Um, don't forget to check out Macy's.com backslash heel squad for anything in your life that you need home house, fashion, vacation wear, upcoming Mother's Day gifts. Yes, that's almost here too. Uh, we have it all there for you. And of course, it helps us anytime you buy through that landing page, macy's.com backslash heel squad. 
Um, and then don't forget to grab Jesse's book, The Glucose Goddess Method, your four-week guide to cut cravings, get your energy back, and feel amazing. Uh, you can get it wherever books are sold. It is out May 3rd officially. Um, in the meantime, be nice people. Drink your vinegar. <laughs> be nice people. Make good choices and be present. This podcast and all related content published or distributed by or on behalf of Maria Menunos or MariaMenunos.com is for informational purposes only and may include information that is general in nature and that is not specific to you. Any information or opinions expressed or contained herein are not intended to serve as or replace medical advice, nor to diagnose, prescribe, or treat any disease, condition, illness, or injury, and you should consult the healthcare professional of your choice regarding all matters concerning your health, including before beginning any exercise, weight loss, or healthcare program. If you have or suspect you may have a healthcare emergency, please contact a qualified healthcare professional for treatment. Any information or opinions provided by a guest expert or host featured within website or on company's podcast are their own, not those of Maria Menounos or the company. Accordingly, Maria Menounos and the company cannot be responsible for any results or consequences or actions you may take based on information or opinions.